time for us to begin our Bible class this morning. We are in the book of Numbers, and uh, we're in chapter uh, 31. We're going to do our best to get through the, the, the rest of the book of Numbers. We may not quite get there. I know there's five chapters there, but a lot of it is just a rehearsal of some of the things that have already gone on, a list of places, a list of cities, and so we'll, uh, we'll talk about what we need to mention from those, and then we'll, we'll move on. But before we get started, we want to go to God in a word of prayer, and so we ask that you bow with us. Our wonderful God and our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day and for all the blessings of this life. We pray, Father, that you would be with us as we into our period of Bible study, that the cares and concerns of this life would be placed aside, that we would focus upon thee, upon thy word, and upon the things that you would have us to do to be pleasing unto thee. We're so grateful, Father, for your love and mercy that you have extended toward us. We recognize, Father, without your love and mercy that we would have no hope. And we pray, Father, that you'd help us to appreciate that more each and every day of our lives. We pray, Father, this time that you forgive us that we can stand clean and pure before thee as we enter into our period of Bible study. We pray, Father, your continued blessings upon all of our number that are sick. We also pray, Father, your blessings upon those that have recently lost loved ones. We pray, Father, that you would... Continue over your blessings upon the Burns family and Sister Billy's passing. We pray, Father, to be with uh, the Jackie Turnbow family and his passing. We pray, Father, that they, that they all may find comfort in thee and in thy word. We pray, Father, to help us all to realize that our time on earth will someday come to a close. And we pray, Father, that we'd always seek to be ready for that time. That we'd put thee first in everything. That when we make mistakes, that we'd have a heart of repentance. We would all seek, seek, uh, seek to share thy word with others, that they too may enjoy the blessings that come from being thy children. We pray, Father, be with us through this hour and be with us through our worship. We pray, Father, that all that we do would be pleasing unto thee. For this is our prayer in your son's blessed name. Amen. As our time ran out last week, we were just beginning to discuss the 31st chapter of the book of Numbers. Just look at these, uh, consider the latter part of the book of Numbers, sort of preparation for the entering into the promised land. Remember that when Aaron died, what year was it? Anybody remember? It was the 40th year. That means that they're entering into the promised land, they're crossing over uh, and, and, and conquering Jericho. It's just around the corner. And so there were some things that needed to be taken care of prior to the entering into the, into the land. And so things like, who's going to divide the land? How is it going to be? Uh, divided the allocation of cities for the Levites, the the, the the setting up of cities of refuge, questions about inheritance, all of that needed to be resolved before they crossed over into the promised land. They've been camping in the plains of Moab for some time. Uh, this again is what it would have looked like if they would have been there in the plains of Moab. One thing that needed to be taken care of before they crossed on over was the vengeance on the land of Midian. The land of Midian, of course, the Midianites were on the Transjordan area. They were the nation that had called for Balaam to come and to curse. They were also the ones, or at least part of the ones, that had led the people into sin in Numbers chapter 25 that resulted in 23,000 people falling in one day. And so when we come to Numbers chapter 31, God begins that chapter by telling them it's time to take vengeance on the Midianite and tells Moses, after you do that, then you're going to be gathered to your people. Now, this is your last leading of the people into war. No more conquest for Moses to take care of. Everything else is going to take place under the leadership of Joshua. And so Moses gave the command in three to five for the people to go take vengeance on the Midianites. They were going to take a thousand people from each tribe and go to war. So, if we do that quickly in our head, how, how large is this army that's going? 12,000. Remember, we're always talking about 12 tribes. Uh, if we're talking about land tribes, there's 12. We're talking about sons of Jacob, there's 12. Uh, how they're counted up may differ a little bit, but we always have that number 12. And so 12,000 men are going to go into battle against the Midianites. And when they go to war, they're, they're, they're supposed to destroy everyone that is in their path, or all the males that are there. So they go to war in 6 to 12. And when they go to war, 
there's Phineas, the son of Eleazar the priest, and the holy articles, and the signal trumpets are in his hand, and he signals that it's time for war, and they go to battle. And it says down in verse 7, they killed all the males. Uh, one thing I want you to just remember about that statement very quickly before we go on, that it's probably a reference to all of the males that had come out to fight against them. Not every single male in the Midianites. And I say that because, guess what's going to happen later on in the biblical story? Go over in the book of Judges, for example. Let me just give you one example. Judges chapter 6, and in verse 1, who oppresses the people of Israel during the days of Gideon? They're delivered into the hands of who? The Midianites. So obviously the Midianites were not wiped out, were not completely destroyed during that period of time. So killing all the males either refers to all of the males in the army that had come out to fight and the others had not been killed but didn't come out to battle, or maybe more likely just those in that particular area of Midian that had been part of the sin of Numbers chapter 25. But after they had killed these males and they had gathered the spoil, they come back. The spoil consisted of booty and it consisted of animals and it consisted of men. When you come to verses six through uh, verses thirteen through verse four, uh, the rest of the chapter actually through verse uh, fifty-four, we have the sequel to the war. Now, this is what happens afterwards. They get back from the war and they report to Moses. What is Moses' reaction? He's mad. What's he mad about? Who have they brought back? It, said, it mentions here that when they had gone out, that they had brought back women alive, and also they had brought with them uh, apparently some of the younger uh, people as well. And so Moses was angry with the officers of the army, with his captains over thousands, the captains over hundreds who had come to battle, and he said to them, had he kept all the women alive? Why would that make Moses so angry? Who was responsible for the sin of Numbers 25? It was largely the women. They were the ones that had come out and had committed harlotry with the people of Israel. And that's why he says in verse 6, Look, these women caused Israel to sin through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord and the incidents of Beor, and there was a great plague among the congregation of the Lord. Now therefore kill every male among the little ones. Sometimes that seems harsh. I know when we're reading through the biblical story, but what's God's purpose in that? What's he trying to do for the people of Israel? Do what? With their influence. He's trying to remove that influence. He's trying to keep the nation pure so that there's none of that evil influence when they go into that. We're going to talk again just a little bit, a couple of chapters over, where God's going to say, when you go in, you remove what? Everybody out of the land. He's trying to purify the land. What about the women? Those males are going to be those that are going to grow up and they're going to what? Be part of the military strength of the nation's so you need to remove you need to remove them. The women that were part of the uh, that had known a man, they were to be killed. They were part of the story of Numbers 25. The women who happened to be virgins, what happened to them? They kept them as as servants in order to serve them. And so you begin by the dealing with this execution of the children. And, uh, the male children, I should say, and any non-virgin women are executed in verses 13 through verse 18. Then in verse 19 through verse 24, you have the purification of the warriors and the beauty, uh, booty. Remember, you come in contact with the dead body, what happens? You become unclean. It's pretty hard to go to war and not come in contact with what? Death and destruction. Particularly in days of hand-to-hand -hand combat, it would be nearly impossible. And so the warriors, they had to pro follow the purification process and stay outside the camp. Uh, not only was that to be purified, anything that they got was to be purified. If it was something that could be purified by fire, then they purified by fire. What would that be? Okay. Do what? Gold. Metals. Anything that could pass through the fire and it didn't what? 
destroy it. You know, uh, so you know there are some things you can place into the fire, and they're not. You take, for example, they take cast iron skillets. You put it through the fire, what? It's not going to hurt it. It doesn't damage it. It's the same when it comes out on the other side, except it's uh, clean, cleaner. So anything that could be purified by fire was purified by fire. Now, obviously, if you take booty that consisted of garments or uh, leather goods, can you pass those through the fire? No, that's going to destroy them, so how were they purified? They were purified with water. And so you had the purifying of the water. Then you had the dividing of the plunder. Now, keep this in mind, by the way. All of this was not part of what God had originally said He was going to give to the people of Israel. When they go actually over into the land of Canaan and begin to conquer, the first thing they conquered is Jericho, and God was given what? All the booty of that land, the first fruits. But this was, this was not part of that original uh, land promise. In fact, at the time of this conquering of Midian, Israel has no intention at that point in time of staying on that side of the Jordan River. That's going to be the next story that is going to come up. But with that plunder, it had to be divided. And what Moses said is you take that plunder and you divide it between those that went to war and those that didn't go to war. In other words, the people that stayed home, that didn't go to war, they got part of the booty too. They were part of that effort, even though they may not have actually been able to go out to war. Those that had to keep the home fires burning, if we'd say, those that had to keep the everything, I care for the children, the flocks, that was just as vital and as important to Israel and their function as of those that went out to war. So that booty is taken and it is going to be divided. And from that which went to the children of Israel, half, or the men of war's half, they were to take one out of every 500 that they got, and that was given to, um, it, it was given uh, as an offering to the Lord. Of that which was given to the people that stayed back home, the children of Israel, they had to take one out of every 50, and that was to be given to the Levites who kept charge of the tabernacle of Israel. The Lord. So, if you look at the total plunder, this is what they received. And when it's divided up, you've got 6, uh, 675,000 sheep. The Lord's portion, this would have been paid out of who? Out of what the men of war got. You took one out of every 500, so they would get, they gave their portion to the Lord, 1,350. The Levite's portion came out of what was given to. The, the people, and so 13,500. You can see by multiple of 10, they have to give more than what the men that went to war. And then at the end, the women, 32,000, uh, those that were taken that would actually become uh, servants. So you have the division of this plunder that was taken in the land. And then going back finally to where I want the next chapter, in verse, 20, uh, verse uh, 48, through the end of the chapter, you have this offering of the, the, the officers. This is a free will offering. This is something God had not commanded them to do. But the officers got to counting up their men. Um, and again, you've heard me say before, Bible talks in round numbers. 12,000 men went, went to war. How many came back? 12,000. What are, what are the odds that you ever go to battle, particularly in that kind of battle in that day, and you come back with every man you left with. It's not going to happen apart from what? God. Apart from God. <laughs> Unless the Lord's with you, it's not going to happen. Somebody among those 12,000 is going to make a mistake. Somebody's going to let their guard down, aren't they? Somebody's going to be caught by surprise. It just doesn't happen that you go to war with somebody else and you don't have a single casualty in that battle. But they begin to count up and they realize what? We haven't lost anyone. In fact, look verse 49. Your servants have taken account of the men of war who are under our command and not a man is missing. Nobody's missing. And they realize that since nobody's missing, they owe their gratitude to God for that. And so they bring the offerings, this free will offering of gold, armlets, bracelets, signet rings, and uh, to offer unto the Lord, and they offer that and give that unto, unto God. And so the, it, it's a reminder that the victory that they had was a victory because of 
the Lord. So you've got the Midianites. God said there's going to be vengeance taken on them, and vengeance was at the direct command of God. But now in Numbers chapter 32, we come to what is going to set the stage for the occupation of the land on that Transjordan area. The area that is on the east of the Jordan, we may call it the Transjordan area. Sometimes it is referred to as the land of Gilead. Uh, sometimes we just say the land east of the Jordan. But it, it, it's that land on that side, that, not the side that, that borders the Mediterranean Sea, but you cross over the Jordan River in that Transjordan, uh, Transjordan area. Let me get back here real quick and I'll get to cover. But this area over here, See, you have the Jordan River that runs all the way through here. The people are going to cross our, our, our excuse me, right up through there. It's, it's, uh, that's the key title. Of it. Jordan River that runs up from the Salt Sea. And what you have here is this is the land that people are going over to conquer. Remember, they were going to pass by Edom. They weren't going to touch Moab on the way as long as what? They didn't bother them. The Moabites came out, and then, then they went to battle against them. So they've, they've conquered this land now. The land of Sihon, the land, uh, not the land, the land of the leadership of King Sihon, and, and all. And so what happens when we get back to chapter 32 is two tribes initially, the, the Reubenites and the Gadites. Now, I know, I know this, and, you, and you're probably already thinking, I thought it was Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And that's true, but the Man uh, Manasseh is not introduced to the end of the chapter. Apparently they were not part of the original request. Where you had Reuben and Gad, they came to, to Moses and they said, we've been looking at this land. We've got a lot of livestock and this land would be just what? Perfect for the raising of the livestock. And so we think we'd like just to settle down right here in this land. And Moses in verse 6 through verse 15 his reaction is what? It's not one that says, what a great idea. In fact, what is Moses concerned about? Really two things. What's he concerned about? Yeah. Number one, he's concerned about the fact that they're wanting to settle down here instead of what? Going and fighting. So you take out Reuben, you take out Gad, and they don't go to fight. They don't cross over the Jordan River. Well, that, that sounds an awful lot like what happened back in Numbers 13. At least it does to Moses, doesn't it? I remember back when Numbers 13, Moses says, we came to Kadesh Barnea to see the land, and the people didn't want to go in, and we had to stay in the wilderness for 40 years, and we all died there. Do you all not remember that? So his concern is that their intentions are, we're not going to cross over at all. We've already got this land. We're going to stay right here. The second effect is that if they don't go, what? It's going to scourge everybody else from going. This is what he says here in verse 7. Will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land from which the Lord has given them? Thus your fathers did when I sent them away from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. And so he says they're going to discourage others. Maybe, maybe if Reuben and Gad say, you know what, we'll stay over here. When the land's already conquered, then maybe Ephraim, Judah, well, you know what? Why don't we just stay here too? You know, well, we'll just settle down here in this land. And so Moses is very angry about that. And he expresses that anger in verses 6 through verse 15. And he believes that they're setting the stage for the people being destroyed in the wilderness. But then in verse 16 through verse 19, you have the explanation of the Reubenites and the Gadites. By the way, I, I think in some of these stories here, you know, we may think, okay, what's the practical value of these stories? Well, you, you always, always see God's protective care over His people. I would think some, in some of these stories, like the one here in number 32, and like the, what I, I almost view as a corresponding story over at the end of the book of Joshua when they, they finally send the, the, the eastern tribes back home. I think you learn something from the example of Moses and the people, and then later Joshua and the people, about resolving conflict. You know, what happens is Moses is angry. You know why Moses is angry? Because he misunderstood what the people had in mind. You ever know where a misunderstanding like that takes place, and then somebody flies off the handle, and they act before they take time to get the facts. I will say this, one thing you learn 
in this conflict is first of all, Moses expressed what the disagreement was. Ever known somebody to have a conflict? Nobody knows what conflict's about. You know? You tell somebody, why are you angry? And they say, what? Well, I'm not angry. But you really know what? They are. There's some underlying problem, but they never will tell you what. What the problem is, well, you don't know what the problem is. What does that mean? You can't solve it. It's awful hard for you to solve the problem, isn't it? Yeah. So the conflict begins with Moses immediately expresses his concern. This is what I'm concerned about. I am concerned about the fact that you're not going to go over. I'm concerned that it's going to discourage the people. So it began with Moses doing what Moses should have done, which is if he thought they were doing wrong, what? Express that. The second thing that takes place is the people explain, and Moses is willing to what? He's willing to listen. And between Moses expressing what his problem was, the people listening to what Moses said, responding, and Moses listening, guess what happens? They got settled. They got settled. They got settled. Same thing is going to happen over in Joshua, in the book of John, I think, chapter, uh, well, let me tell you. I don't want to tell you wrong. It's over in the book of, uh, of uh, of Joshua, where the people are sent back uh, over the land, chapter 22, is when they're sent back, they're going to go to war with the people on the eastern tribe after they build that altar. You remember that story? They build the altar, and they're, they're ready to go to war, and they get over there, but before the, the first sword is thrust or anything takes place, they sit down and they talk, and then they realize what this was a disagreement that uh, is, is just a difference in how we perceive things in versus reality, and so the problem is resolved. What's the explanation of the Rubites and the Gadites that have to bring this conflict here to an end? They would go over it in the fire. Yeah. Okay, they <clears throat> right. They said to Moses, no, no, that's, that's not what we intended at all. I mean, Moses had said, your brother go to war while you sit here, back in verse 6. And they said, that's not what we intended at all. What we intend is you let us get everything in order here. We're going to build the sheep poles for our sheep and, and, and let us build cities for our little ones. And then we'll go over and we'll help to, to conquer the land. And then when the land is conquered, then we'll come back home. But we will not return to our home until every one of the children of Israel has received his inheritance. We're going to go help to fight. Just let us come back when the war is over and settle down here. What's Moses say? Moses is okay with a warning. Okay, Moses is okay with it with this warning. Uh, it's like Moses is saying, I'm taking you at your word. You have said you're going to go over, and I believe you're going to go over. But write this down. Take note. Okay. You write this down. If you don't do what you said you're going to do, what? Yeah. Be sure your sin will find you out. Okay? You're not going to be able to just make this promise to me now and then later on lie about it and get by with it. If you are deceiving me, what? You will what? Pay for it. The, you know, that's a statement we, we, we quote many times, verse 23. Be sure your sin will find you out. Is that always true? It is true. Sin, sin will always find you out. You can't get by with flaunting the Lord's will. It may not always find us out here, but sin will always ultimately find us uh, out. He also told them that, uh, told the people as he grants this approval that if they go with you and help you conquer, then they can come back. If they choose to, they can go over and they can occupy the land over there. But they're going to what? They're going to go over and they're going to help you fight. If they, and if they don't help you fight, then they cannot obtain this land that has been promised uh, to them. So that land is allotted on the east side of the Jordan, verse 33 through verse 42. I'm not going to go through all of these uh, places that are mentioned here, but this is where, look down in verse 33, you've got Reuben, you've got Gad, and now who do you have? Half the tribe of Manasseh. And Manasseh is a large tribe, but half of them are going to live on one side of the Jordan, half of them are going to live on, uh, on in the Transjordan area, and half of them are going to live on the western side of the Jordan. So we've got the, the Midianites are taken care of. You've got the dividing of the land on the east side of the Jordan. And Numbers chapter 33 is a chapter that I don't think is going to take very long to get through at all. Now, 
when you read through that chapter, it's the kind of chapter, by the way, that if you came to me and you said, what's the scripture reading tonight and I gave you this chapter, nobody would be happy. It's a bunch of cities, a bunch of big names in, in, uh, of cities in that, in that chapter. What is it? It is a going over of the journey from the time they left Egypt until the time that they were out on the plains of Moab. So it is, it is a going through that journey. And, and as they go through it, it's sort of a reminding them that God has what? Been with them. God has taken care of them. God has provided for them. See, one other thing you learn in this, in this chapter. I'm going to take you through it very quickly. But uh, there are 42 different places of Canada in this journey. How many have we seen at this point have you going through the history through Exodus and Numbers? Not many. I mean, we've come to places like Kadesh Barnea, Mount Sinai, but the vast majority of these places were never mentioned in the biblical story. Now, that, what, what a chapter like this reminds me of is a couple of things. Number one, it reminds me that what we have in the record of Israel's history in these 40 years is actually just what? Snapshot. Just a snapshot. It's, it's a small smattering of actually what, what took place. I mean, can you imagine what it would be like if it... And then it related to every campground and everything that took place. So what we have, in, in not just in, the, in Exodus and Numbers, but the entire Bible story is just what? Just what pertains to the unfolding of the story, which is the bringing of Christ into this world and the preserving of the nation of Israel. I wish I could point on a map and show you every single campground that they had. Perhaps there's a lot of these places we don't even know where they're at. We can't even locate them with certainty. So, but here's how I would outline the chapter very quickly. The journey from Ramses, Ramses and that is mentioned in the R-A-M-E-S-E-S, it should be to the Red Sea, 5 to 10, the Red Sea to the wilderness of Sinai in 11 to 15, the wilderness of Sinai to Mount Moore, 16 to 39, and Mount Moore to the plains of Moab, 41 to 49, and then the instruction on the conquering of the promised land. So that's how I would outline that chapter. And so... Uh, originally, I just had it outlined as the journey from 5 to 49 this morning. Uh, it, it, if you break it down this way, those the Red Sea, Mount Sinai, Mount Bor, all those are key places, and so we're trying, that, that helps us keep everything sort of straight as they go as they go through here. So, for example, you go Ramsey, Suffolk, Etham, uh, Migdal, Mara, Elam. Uh, and the Red Sea. A lot of those are mentioned. In fact, you see where I have mentioned on this other side? That's where they're mentioned in the book of Exodus as they make their journey. So early on, you do follow most of those places when it comes from Ramses to the Red Sea. But then when you start from Red Sea to the wilderness of Sinai, you go to the wilderness of Sin, Exodus 16.1. Then look at these other places. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Dothka, Alush, those are not mentioned in the book of Exodus. Rephidim is, that's where uh, an important event takes place in Exodus 17 and verse 1. And then they come into the wilderness of Sinai. Then you go from Sinai to Mount Hor. Now this is a long list of names. And you go from Kerbrat Hadaba, that is mentioned in, in the book of Exodus, Hazaroth, uh, or in the book of Numbers, Ritma, Remen, Perez, Libna, Rissa, uh, Tehilipa, if I'm saying this wrong, just ignore it. Mount, Mount Shefer, uh, Hadera, uh, Hadera, Makaloth, uh, uh, Tehoth, Tira, Mitha, Hashemona, Hashemona. See, none of those are mentioned, by the way, anywhere else outside of this particular uh, chapter. Well, all of a sudden, my... there we go. Mozarah, Ben Jacob, Hor Haggadet, whatever that is, Dot uh, Batha, uh, uh, Abarona, uh, Ezon Geber, that's one we realized, in the wilderness of Zion, Arkadesh, Barnea, and then Mount Hor. So all of those are places where they would go and they would camp and then they would move on. What happens at Mount Hor that starts this period of, I've got another period of transition, by the way? Who died on Mount Hor? Aaron did. Uh, interestingly enough, there are only two dates given in the entire book of Numbers 33. In other words, we don't know like, when were they in this location, when were they in this location. We don't really know. I mean, we can Mount Sinai, we can know back from the book of Exodus. But the only dates given are back in the very first part of the chapter. If you'll notice this, 
when they leave, look, verse 3, they departed from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day of the first month. That's what, by the way, that's Passover. That's when they left Egypt. The only other date given in this is over in verse 38. And that is that Aaron died in what? The 40th year after the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt on the first day of the fifth month. Those are the only two dates given in this. But what they tell us is from the time they leave Ramses to the time they come to Mount Hor, how much time has passed? 40 years have passed. Then from Mount Hor to the plains of Moab, Zalmona, Thunan, Obah, uh, Eom, Dion Gad, uh, none of these places are mentioned except when they come to Debo again in the plains of Moab by the Jordan opposite Jericho. And so, uh, all you need to remember about chapter 33 is you need to go home, of course, and memorize all 42 of those names so that you can, you know, take everybody through the journey. Uh, but all you need to re really remember is that it's, it's a rehearsal of the 40 years. And a couple of highlights there being uh, the dating of, of the leaving and then the, uh, the dating of Moses' um, you know, of Aaron's death. The other thing that takes place, and I'm not going to go all the way back to that chart, but verse 50 through the end of the chapter, number 33, is the final instruction before they go in to conquer the people of the land. What is the instruction when you go in? Drive out all the inhabitants. Destroy all their molded images. In other words, you kill who? Everyone. Or drive them out, and you destroy everything in uh, the land. Do they do that later on, by the way? No. They don't. Um, you know, they, Israel, it's always easy for me sometimes, I think, to sort of sit back in condemnation of Israel and say, why didn't they do this? Why didn't they do that? You know, they, they left the job half done. But then again, how many times have we left jobs half done? You know, we get to a point and then we just sort of leave it undone. You know, maybe... Uh, maybe spiritually speaking, you know, we work to convert somebody, we get them baptized, and then what? We leave, we, we quit. We're, we're leaving the job half done. And it's in terms of what God told us to do, because He told us to, to go baptize, but He also said, well, after that, teach them to observe all things. Uh, people are just, I think, by nature, bad sometimes to get it. You know, we start out with such enthusiasm and excitement, and we get so far in, and then what happens? We, you know, we just quit. We just quit. Um, and that's what the people of Israel are going to do. They're going to get into the land. They're going to get enough of the people cleared away that they can settle down in somewhat a matter of peace. But then they quit. And as a result of that, the people are going to be a thorn in their side. And that's what eventually is going to lead to the, the fall of the nation of Israel. If you ever look back and say, I wonder how things would have been so much different had they just, what, obeyed God when he told them to remove the land. And the people in the land destroy all the idols. But when they fail to do that, then they set the stage for apostasy. By the way, you also learn sometimes failures of previous generations can have a profound impact upon what? Future generations. I mean, the, the nation here was long gone, been gone for hundreds of years before Israel or ba uh, fell to Assyria and Judah to Babylon. But they had to share part of that responsibility, didn't they? Because of their failure to obey. But God said, remove everything out of the land. Chapter 34. Let me check my time. Then we'll get into the book of Deuteronomy starting next week. Which is a great book about spiritual renewal. You've got the boundaries of the land given in verse 1 to 15. And you've got the dividers of the land in 16 to 29. You've got some of the places mentioned. Now, this is sort of hard for you to see. It's the only map I've got that has the boundaries of the land on there. I'm going to blow it up here in just a minute. But these, these, these boundaries are given in terms of where the land was going to be occupied. So let's focus in, first of all, down at the bottom. Some of those, by the way, Zephron, Shapham, and Ayu, we have no idea where they are. And so it's hard to say. This is, this is the boundary there. But focusing in on the bottom part down here, in Numbers chapter 34, the south border from the wilderness of Sin, the border of Eden, and the southern border shall extend eastward to the end of the Salt Sea. The Salt Sea and the Dead Sea is one is the, one and the same. You shall, your border shall turn from the southern side of the ascent of Agrippa, uh, which is right there. 
and it shall continue and go to Hazar, Adar, and continue to Aslan. So in other words, the borders that come what? Right across through here at the southern border. Now there are going to be times they're going to occupy more land than that. But this is the land that was promised uh, to them and all the way to the brook Egypt. Well, you ever, you ever remember reading, for example, even going back to the book of Genesis, where well, God will promise the land all the way to the river Egypt. Now, the river Egypt is not the Nile. Okay, that is the dominant river in Egypt. But the river Egypt is actually the Swadi, our brook of Egypt. And when we talk about a wadi in the, in the Bible, a wadi is sort of like a, uh, a wet weather spring or wet weather creek. In other words, it, it would run the water for what? Part of the year, but during the dry part of the year, it would, it would dry up. And so it was sort of a wadi. But, but this was a well-known wadi or river. And the, and the border would extend all the way over the back side uh, to the east. All, of course, right here in the west, what's the border? It's going to be the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean Sea. And then to the north, some of these places like Zephron and others, we can't, uh, we can't uh, identify. But if we focus in up here, all the way up to Kadesh, Zedan, all of these were mentioned here as the border of the land. So when you go back to this big map, basically what it means, it's from all the way up here to Kadesh, in this area here, over here, and all the way down to the Jordan River being the border on this side. Remember, this was the land of Gilead, it's already been divided up. All the way down to the wilderness of sin, across from Kadesh Barnea and to the river Egypt, was going to be the borders of the land that they are going to occupy. So that's what he's telling them in chapter 34. And at the end of chapter 34, a leader from each tribe is is uh, picked out that is going to help with the dividing of the land. How is the land going to be divided? First of all, it's going to be divided by populations of bigger tribes. Get more also by lot. What does that mean? It, 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 it was a way, I think, of course, the, the cash of lots, the Bible says, and, and, and I think it's true, God could control how the lot failed. But it's sort of like if you've ever had a conflict with somebody who wants to do things, you say, okay, let's draw straws and let's see whoever gets the largest straw. In other words, there could be no accusation of what? Favoritism. Of favoritism, prejudice, and the divided up because it's all a matter of what? Sort of chance that it falls by, by that. So to some degree, that the law was probably designed <laughs> to help eliminate any complaint about how the land was going to be divided up by, by population and by, by law is what you need to remember about that. We come to chapter 35 and there are two important provisions that are made here in this chapter. That is of the Levitical cities and then the cities of refuge. How many Levitical cities were there going to be? Remember the Levites did not get what? A chunk of land. Okay? They didn't get a chunk of land because they were going to be scattered throughout the land because they were there for the purpose of uh, of helping to spiritually serve the people and to help with the with the priest. And so they were going to be given land in the, in the city. And how many cities were they to be given? Can I give the answer? 48 cities. Six of those cities were also going to be cities of, of refuge. And so in these cities, in addition to giving them these 48 cities, they also, in every city, they were to be given some area, what? Outside, in order to, to, to keep their livestock and do the things that they, that, they needed to, that they needed to do. And so you had the Levitical cities, and I would show you, a, I, I, mean, I would show you, a, uh, here, here's all the Levitical cities. I just have to show you, because unless you've got some really good eyes, I bet you don't see them. From there, but you can see all of these cities are the Levitical cities, and I'll put that on the on the uh, website. You can download it here again. Every green city in here, if you can see that, I can barely see from where I'm standing. All of those are Levitical cities. Forty-eight of them scattered throughout throughout the land. Of those forty-eight, six of those were also cities of refuge. Three on the Transjordan, three on the, the western side of the Jordan. Here they were, Kedesh, Shechem, Hebron, Mezer, Raboth, and Golan. What is the purpose of these cities of refuge? Yeah. They were for the protection.
Extra the one that committed manslaughter. If somebody killed somebody in cold blood, I'm just summarizing this the end of this chapter up for you. If, if I took an implement, wooden implement, and I hit you upside the head and you died, that's murder. And so I was to be what? Put to death. If I picked up a stone and I, out of anger, threw that at you uh, and thought about it when I did it and you died, then I was guilty of murder. But what about a scenario where you push somebody, for example, you get an argument, there's no premeditation, but you push somebody and then they die. Well, or another scenario that's laid out in this chapter, uh, you've got a young person out here and they're throwing rocks, you know, for example, I, just by way of illustration, they're tossing rocks off the hill. And there's somebody below it and they get hit in the head with the rock and they die. You know, they didn't do that intentionally. And, you know, it may have been ignorant, it may have been stupid to do it, but they didn't do it intentionally. These cities of breakage were intended as a place where individuals that were killed somebody could run and they were protected from being killed by some close family member until the point that a examination or a trial could take place. If a trial took place and they were found guilty of murder, then what happened? They were put to death. If they were found guilty of manslaughter, <coughs> or unintentionally, I guess say, unintentionally killing someone, then what happened? They were safe. They were safe as long as they stayed in the city of refuge. How long did they have to stay there? Until the high priest died. And so and that, was the, that was the rule. for the, You got outside the city of refuge, what happened? You're on your own. Okay, you're on your own. But they had, why would they have six, by the way, three on each side? Do you think? Close proximity to everybody that needed one. You know, if all the seeds of refuge had been on the other side of the Jordan, where would that have left the people in the land of Gilead? Well, probably before they could have got to a city of refuge, they might well have been able to have been <coughs> caught and killed. And so they put that in, in close proximity to everyone. There, there's some parallels to be drawn, by the way, between the cities of refuge and Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus is our refuge. Uh, there is refuge to be found only as long as we are what? In him. You know, uh, Christ is near to everyone. No, anybody can what? Find access to him if they choose to do so. Uh, if they choose to do so. And so, uh, they're, 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 when you think about the refuge, and, and, and when you get into the, new, uh, the book of Psalms and how frequently it says God is our refuge, and I, mean, I think there's probably no doubt that many of the Israelites would have thought about those cities and the purpose they served, and where they could flee in the time of need and in the time of, of hell. One more chapter here. I know that's a lot of material this morning, but again, I don't see any purpose in trying to break that down uh, verse by verse and go into all of those things. You have a complaint of the children of Gilead in verses 1 through verse 4. This goes back to something we talked about last week. End of chapter 29. Remember the daughters of Zelophehead? who had come and said, Daddy didn't have any boys, and it's not fair that we don't get anything because he didn't have any sons. And Moses went to the Lord, and the Lord said, What? They're right. They should get an allotment uh, of land. They should receive an inheritance. Well, the, the children of Gilead, which is the, where the, the uh, daughters of Zelophehad were from, get to thinking about it. And they think, get to thinking that if the daughters of Zelophehad get an inheritance, Okay, and then they meet up with a guy from Judah. Now, this is my illustration. This is not what the chapter says, but this is what the illustration says. They meet up from a tribe of Judah, and they marry into the tribe of Judah, then what happens to that land? It goes to Judah. It goes to the tribe of Judah. And so maybe they even envision a scenario where others might even use marriage as a means what? To get that, that land. And, it, it, and the, the year of Jubilee or nothing like that would help because it would go back to its original owner, but now its original owner was what married into the tribe of Judah. So we're concerned about that. And so they come and they express that complaint to Moses in verses 1 to verse 4. And so Moses comes back in verses 5 through verse 8, and he said, what you say is right. That's a legitimate concern. And so they place a condition upon them marrying. And that is, the daughters of Zelophehad uh, can marry whoever they want as long as what? It's of their own tribe. 
And if they marry in their own tribe, they can get their inheritance. But if they marry, that inheritance still is going to stay within the, the tribe. And so that's the instruction that is given. And the inheritance of the children of Israel shall not change hands from tribe to tribe. For every one of the children of Israel should keep his inheritance of the tribe of his fathers. And every daughter who possesses an inheritance in any tribe of the children of Israel shall be the wife of one of the family of her father's tribe, so that the children of Israel each may possess the inheritance of his father. Thus no inheritance shall change hands from one tribe to another, but every tribe of the children of Israel shall keep its own inheritance. So you've got a principle here that is laid down, particularly because the children of Gilead have expressed concern, but it really goes beyond that destiny. It's going to have an effect beyond that, and that is now we know that every part of the allotted land has to stay within the tribe that it was originally given to. And so you're not going to have land that's passing from, from tribe to tribe or from, uh, from uh, clan to clan. How does God as a lot of have respond to that? Because what it said in verse 10, just the Lord commanded, so did so they, they, they did. Um, they were married to the sons of their father's brothers. And so they received the inheritance, and then it, they married within the family. And they were married in the family of the children of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And their inheritance remained in the tribe of their father's family. These are the commandments and the judgments which the Lord commanded the children of Israel by the hand of Moses in the plain of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. In other words, these are all the things that were said there now are making the preparation now for the entering into the promised land. Now, one thing's going to have to happen first, though, before they're ready to go in. Or well, really two things are going to have to happen first. Number one, they're going to need to be reminded. And that's really what the book of Deuteronomy is about that we'll begin next week. And I, and I think the book of Deuteronomy, in many ways, is, is much more practical, I don't say much more, than Exodus and Numbers. It is a book about some principles about spiritual renewal. You can sort of learn from that book and, and what Moses had to tell the people. Deuteronomy means what? Anybody know? Second law or repetition of the law. There's not a lot of new material in there. But what he's telling the people is here are some things you need to be you need to remember before you go into the land. So one thing needs to happen is that, and it is sort of interesting when you think about it this way. For the people to go into the promised land, they had to be reminded of what God had done for them and reminded of the law before they passed over. But you know what's going to happen as soon as they get over into the land? What's God going to tell them to do? They read the law again. So on both sides, there's this reminder. And we learn something about how important it is for us to constantly be what? Reminded of what God's law says, even though God had just told them some of those things. They needed to hear it again and again. The second thing that's going to take place in Deuteronomy as we go through there is Moses has to die. Yeah, Moses has to die. And one thing I've said before, just keep saying this page for next week, you can never turn your page in the Bible and tell how much time passes, right? Okay, you never can. We might be one year at Sinai, and then we may turn a page, uh, turn lots of pages in one year pass, and then we may turn one page and sometimes what? Four years pass. Almost instantly. Uh, the book of Deuteronomy is a book that consists... I think of 30 chapters, if my memory serves me correctly. All of these are really just, are uh, not 30, 34 chapters. Um, it's really just four sermons that Moses delivers in the, in the land of Moab. It's a series of four, uh, four discourses. Um, I'm going to divide it a little bit different uh, than that. Some of the discourses, like the first one, is only four chapters. The second one is 22 chapters. But there, there are a series of sermons, and so this would have taken place in a matter probably of just a few days, where Moses is called before the people, and he is going to deliver the sermons to them to prepare them to enter into the promised land. And then when the book of Deuteronomy ends, we're going to say goodbye to that great servant of God that we have come to know and appreciate and has led the people who is going to be left outside the promised land because of what he had done back in Numbers chapter uh, 20. But when you go through the book of Deuteronomy, in preparation, go through the first four chapters next week. Don't look at it just from the standpoint of telling you, here's what the children of Israel did. Okay, okay, I know they did. But think about it and write down as you go through it, what does that teach me? 
about my spiritual renewal, about my journey toward the promised land, about what I need to remember in order to help keep myself spiritually strong. So look at it not just from the standpoint of history, but from the standpoint of your practical application of those principles as you make your journey toward the promised land. We'll talk about that next week.